I was like, what if I just send you my, or <laughs> I just like forward your, <laughs> your questions to you. Hi friends, welcome back to my channel. My name is Ashley Ariana, joined by the wonderful Tom Jensen today. I hope yeah. you guys are having a good Wednesday. Um, I feel like I'm coming out hot. I had, uh, had a lot, I had, I made like this barbecue sauce, but I put maple syrup in it and I feel like I've had, I feel like I had a lot of sugar on accident. Yeah, sounds good though. I also had like chocolate and other stuff that has sugar in it. I'm not blaming that. I'm like, cause that's normal for me. I'm, I was just hanging out with my friend the other day and they were like, I was like, my stomach hurts. And they were like, you have to eat something more than chocolate. I was like, I do. But I do feel like I'm one of those people, like, I want to have a sweet treat after the end of every meal. So when yeah. I have, like, when I have my breakfast, I want to have a little sweet treat. When I have my lunch, I want to have a little sweet. Like, I have to have, like, a palate cleanser of something sweet. But, and then I made, I a barbecue sauce is so underrated. I put on Love Twitter, sauce. I put on Twitter, um, so I dip my chicken in, which to be fair, like I, I was vegan up until like a year ago for like most, for like over eight years of my life. Wow. Um, and then for a while after that, I ate fish cause I worked, I lived in Santa Barbara, I went to UCSB and I worked at this restaurant that sell, sold, like it was on the Harbor, had the best fish and you got free dinners, but they didn't uh -huh. have like any, like they were like a seafood only restaurant. And, um, and so I literally used to just like get like free like lettuce in a bowl because they didn't have like quinoa or like anything else. Yeah, they didn't um, have a vegan option for you. Exactly, exactly. And mm. I like broke down when I was there, and that's when I first started eating like seafood or meat again or whatever. Um, the moral of the story is I was with my friend last week, and we were hanging out, and like I just recently started eating chicken and. The only like example of a person I have who eats meat like in my life, because my best friend doesn't eat meat either, um, is my dad. And he's like kind of bodybuildery. So he like mustard is like his condiment of choice. So I yeah. see him dip his chicken in mustard all the time. And I've seen him do this since I was like a kid. So I thought that that's just like what people do with their chicken. Um, so like <laughs> I was like, going out to eat with my friend and stuff. And then like, if I got chicken and they didn't bring mustard with it, I'd be like, oh, like, are you gonna bring the mustard? And so my friend was like telling me- uh, No, no, like, that's not how it works. She was like, you know, that's like not a normal thing that people do. Yeah. I thought she was so wrong. I like went on Twitter and I was like, Paul, like, do you guys dip? Like, I was ready to be like, you don't know anything. I know everything. Oh, Everyone no. was like, you are disgusting. That is, are you talking about honey mustard? Like if you're getting chicken nuggets and honey mustard, yeah, I was like, no, yeah. I'm talking about normal, not even Dijon mustard. But the moral of the story was I'm expanding my condiment palette and ate a bunch of barbecue sauce this morning. And therefore I'm on a little bit of a sugar high, I guess. I don't know. But that brings me yeah. to the 49ers somehow don't know the connection, but I'm just so excited Tom, to talk to you because of the breaking news that's happening. For example, crazy shakeup. The uh, Bills this morning traded Stefan Diggs. And I want to kind of ask you, like, what do you think this trade means for Brandon Ayuk? Because um, I think there's two ways you can take it. You can take it as, oh, maybe the Bills will want to trade for Brandon Ayuk. Maybe this solidifies that teams are more open to trading these star wide receivers or maybe we could take it the opposite and be like, Hey, this kind of solidifies that I don't think the 49ers are going to trade IU at all. Cause when you look at the compensation that the bills got for Stefan Diggs and we can get into it, he's obviously a different player at a different stage of his career, right, right. but I was pretty shocked, especially when you think Brendan Ayuk, whoever, if he was going to get traded to that team would then have to pay him. Stephon Diggs already has his contract, so it's not like they have the team that he's being traded to has to trade for him and pay him. Um, pretty, pretty interesting move. Also, just kind of shocking because Stephon Diggs is, in my opinion, still you know a, an elite wide receiver, a top wide receiver. Yeah. Josh Allen is an incredible QB. Obviously, to start the season last year, we saw a little bit of drama going on there. 
but I didn't, yeah. I wasn't anticipating a, a uh, Stephon Diggs trade yeah. on the, on the horizon. So when you woke up this morning and saw that, what were your takeaways? A couple of things. First is just that, as you mentioned, it's a different thing for my in that he's 30 and he's a cancer and Buffalo wanted to move on from him. I mean, they took a dead cap hit. To get I'm rid of such him. a girl that I, I'm, I'm not even a, like, I, I'm not actually a horoscope person, but when you said that, I was like, oh, why didn't you, you we're talking about his, because that, because that, because cancers no, are like Virgo. overly, <laughs> cancers are overly like emotional and reactionary. And so I was like, oh yeah, oh, I guess that would make okay. sense. So my dick totally is. <laughs> Sorry about okay. that. Sorry about that. 18 cancer. Yes, um, yes, yes. Yeah. So they were looking to get out of him and, you know, He's been a diva. He's said, you know, what about my touches? He's he's basically put himself ahead of the team, and that's why they moved on. Uh, Houston, on the other hand, is saying we we can use an elite wide receiver that's a great vet. Here's a proven player. We can bring him in. We've got the culture to handle it. You know, every team tells themselves that. So that's part of what's going on is this is Buffalo unloaded him, and that's why the compensation wasn't that great. And it's not comparable to Ayuk because he's 25. He's not a cancer. He's not a diva. He works exceptionally hard. He's got a, a great work ethic and skill set. So I think that the Niners could get a lot more for IU. The question then becomes, could they get you know, Buffalo's number one? Probably not because Buffalo has a, a cap situation that makes it tough for them to go get Brandon IU. But I still think there are teams that could look at this and say that you know, we're interested in IU. Pittsburgh, he would be a great fit for them. And so that's a natural trade partner for the Niners is to look at that. You know, I would trade, say, like, Ayuk and 31 to Pittsburgh for 20 and 51. That's a trade I would make right away. Okay. And then you okay. can get Amarius Mims at 20 and a wide receiver at 51, and you still have your second-round pick. So there's a lot that they could still do. But whether that can happen or not, I'm not sure. It's just this draft is so loaded at wide receiver, there could be six receivers in the first. That and, it and makes it hard to deal yeah. I you. So I think it's difficult for the Niners to move on. And I still don't think they will. I, you can look at this and say, now, IU makes too much money. He wants 27.5. And that's really fair. That is his market value. But that's his market value in the abstract. That's not his market value for the Niners because they don't throw enough. So you'd be overpaying him at that rate, even or though it's what he's system. worth. Yeah. For the team and the way that they use him, it's not. And so from that perspective, they could move on and say it's just too expensive. But usually what the Niners do is they'll just drag this out like they always do. The number that they're using right now in the contract negotiations is meaningless. It, it's just contract posturing. And so then you get further down the line, you get toward June, and then, then we'll see what happens in, in the actual negotiations. But you know, yeah. I would think that... The, Eventually, it'll get sorted out. Now, there's a couple things. To start out, I agree. Let, let's start with reasons I think that the team would look at the Stevon Diggs trade and maybe say, okay, like the Bills are, are willing to trade him. Maybe we should be you know, more open to trading Ayuk. I think what you're saying with the draft compensation is obviously the – if they're taking inventory of their team and maybe what has held them back from winning in the immediate, like if we're talking about, I want to win the Super Bowl, the 49ers want to win the Super Bowl in this upcoming season right now, right. Yeah. screw, you know, timelines ahead of time. We're going to work, you know, in the future, we, we, we haven't won one yet. Let's focus on right. winning yeah. right now, going all in right now while Brock is on his rookie deal. What, necessary things were we lacking last year if we were going to go through you know the biggest moments and how would we have won the Super Bowl some might say getting the ball in Ayuk's hands could have you know worked in their favor and could have gotten them a Super Bowl I think yeah. Kyle Shanahan's response to that might be because I I find Kyle Shanahan to kind of come off as a defensive person who's not very open to saying, yeah, this was something that I could have changed. So I think he might have might say, you know, the Ayuk is number three in the progression. When he was just on that uh, Shannon Sharp interview, 
when they they asked him about that third and four thing where uh, Brock Purdy tries to give the ball to Jawan Jennings, and I've heard so much criticism towards Brock about that play and not getting the ball to Ayuk, who was open. Ayuk admits on that show, he's like that – when I look back at the Super Bowl, there's moments that are sore spots for me because I wish I would have gotten the ball more. That's not mm-hmm. one of them because no. I'm never supposed to get the ball there. I'm the third option. And that's before they even know that there's a blitz coming. You know what I mean? Right. So there's right. no way with the amount of protection that Brock Purdy had that he'd have the time to get the ball to a guy like Brandon B.A. So I can understand looking at this team and going, you know, what's actually most important with – Brock Purdy, who has, you know, a skill set that is really tailored and incredible at getting them all, getting the ball out, throwing with anticipation to the middle of the field, you know, we should look to bolster our offensive line. And if we trade away BA, we can get higher up in this draft. We can get a better guy like your guy Mims and have a solidified starter this year and maybe even someone who can Take over. I, I I think you and I have talked and I've read, read some of your articles that he could potentially even switch to taking over for Trent Williams at some point, right? Yeah. If uh, Trent retires, so I can see that. But then on the on the opposing side, I think that IU, you know, I understand why IU would want to be paid more because I think his argument is if I was given those amount of targets, I would produce the way that these elite level players are and why yeah. would Kyle Shanahan be hesitant to change his scheme to um, highlight a guy like Brandon Ayuk, especially, obviously we want to win this up or the 49ers want to come win this upcoming year. But I think how you smooth transition to Brock being your franchise quarterback is making sure this draft you hit on at least, you know, in between two to four guys who are going to be solidified starters and you keep a guy like Brandon Ayuk who's around the same age around the same timeline as Brock Purdy and you have this team that grows as these veterans start kind of dropping off I think if we look two years down the field Christian McCaffrey George Kittle Debo Samuel are those guys that are all gonna you know are I don't think all those guys plus BA are going to be on the team you know what I mean like yeah, I, they're I, going to I, transition out of those guys And they have to do it pretty soon. And we, with, you know, Danny Gray isn't making an appearance. Kim Latu, I wouldn't hold my breath for. So I think that it's important when you do hit on a guy like B.A. in the draft who's, you know, been just a a role model player of what you want. He's outplayed his draft status and he was drafted in the first round. Definitely. Um, I just can't understand not wanting to, you know, navigate your system a little bit to start making him be the number one wide receiver. I think he's starting his ascension this last year that just happened, but I think this upcoming year, and then even the year after that, say they get rid of Debo or, or Chris McCaffrey, one of those guys, both of those guys, and then BA starts getting even more targets. I think he's, you know, he's not at his breakout year yet. So when you look at Stefan Diggs, Diggs has had maybe a, a more decorative career so far, but Diggs is on the downside of his career and, like you said, a locker room right. cancer. Brandon Ayuk, you know, by the everything that he sounds like, he's 100% behind Brock Purdy. He believes in Brock Purdy. Yeah. He carries himself as a leader of this team. He talks about the influence he has in the locker room, and it sounds like he knows that with the youth coming in, the 49ers need a guy like him for the youth to look up to. And maybe it's just like, hey, like Debo's not going to be that guy. Maybe Debo can be friendly, buddy, buddy. But if he's not always consistently in shape, always healthy in the way that Brandon Ayuk is, that's another value that BA brings to the team. Right. So I just can't. I I think that Diggs is worth, should be worth more in a trade if they were to trade him. You know, the other team should be willing to give up more. You have to look at Diggs. When the Vikings traded him, he got more. Like Diggs is thirty; he's older. Aside yeah. from all the problems he's had, he's had an inconsistent, not just like in the locker room, but also just play wise, he's been more inconsistent play wise, and he's older. He's suffered more injuries. Brandon Ayuk is at the highlight, or not even at the highlight, like you know, on the highlight of his tr- career. He's in ascension. Yeah, he's exactly. about to have his best years. So he I hasn't think- played his best yet, but he's about to. 
So if I'm the 49ers, I want to hold on to him and I want to make sure that my team, and especially if I'm, you know, really believe in this quarterback, this quarterback has a guy like Brandon Ayuk. So that's yeah. how I feel if I'm the 49ers. And if I'm a different team, I'm willing to trade a lot more than whatever I was ri- willing to trade for Stephon Diggs. Because I know when I'm getting Diggs, I'm getting a guy who's been a malcontent in multiple locker rooms. And I'm getting a guy who's been inconsistent, suffered with injuries, and unfortunately is on the latter side of his career now. So right. from both sides, if I'm the 49ers, I want to hold on to him more than, you know, uh, I would be willing to give up. I definitely wouldn't accept anything close to, you know, just a second round pick, which is what. Yeah. Stephon what Diggs, Diggs just got. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, so, I think that the apples and apples is you have to compare Diggs when he first got traded you know, okay. like five years ago. And that was for a first round pick that was then used on Justin Jefferson. Yeah. So. And, also, you, that's you need like to look at it that way. I will say though, I think some people they like refer to that and they're like, "See, the 49ers should do that and just like draft the next Jefferson." And it's that's not. It's very no, important that's, to that's, highlight that that's not normally what happens. No, <laughs> that was at like all. a crazy. That was a yeah, crazy they, luck for them. They got lucky, and and, yeah. and good for them. They did that. But the, the important point though is that Diggs got a first round pick, and that if the Niners were to now trade Ayuk. I think that they would be reasonable in saying we want a first rounder back for Brandon. And so that should be the market is 20 to 32. Somebody with a pick in that range would be willing if they value what I brings. And that's why I go to Pittsburgh because teams always value the guy that burned you. I had one of his best games of the year against Pittsburgh. Yeah. What? 130 yards, two touchdowns in the block for McCaffrey. So they're going to look at that and say, that's a guy that can help set our culture. And they'd be willing, I think, to give up a pick if you gave them 31. And so it's just a question of who would have the right value in the way that they look at IU and say that, okay, he can be a difference maker for us. But for the Niners, I, I think to your point, you have to say he can be a part of the core, the young core with Purdy going forward. But in order to make that work, you then have to also say, I'm willing to transition more to Purdy as a center point of the offense. I'm willing to transition to Ayuk as the top target, and I'm willing to transition by investing in the offensive line. If Shanahan's willing to do all those things, great. Then it makes perfect sense to keep Big Brandon Ayuk. And that's the thing, is that Shanahan being so stubborn and so unwilling to, try to confront what he's done that has hurt the team in trying to win a ring, that – if he's not willing to change, then I can see them saying that, well, we don't throw the ball enough for Brandon Ayuk to be worth $27.5 million to us. And so you can look around. But it's still going to be difficult to find a trade partner. It's still going to be difficult to get somebody in the draft that you think could replace Ayuk because he has such a unique skill set. He does so many different things well. It's very hard to get somebody that does all that. You would get part of it. You wouldn't get all of it. So they would have to transition. But if I had to guess, my guess is that they will keep Ayuk, but they will do it their way, which means stretching out the contract negotiation way too long, Ayuk holding out from camp, and it's just a mess. And all of that's avoidable. I look at this and just say that, okay, the Niners are willing to pay him 23, he wants 27.5. Pay him the money he wants, that's $4.5 million. That's money that you were just going to spend on this tight end from Detroit. They just matched yes. it. So why can't you use that six million you were going to spend on right and give it to Ayuk and you're a much better team as a result? I don't understand it. It's just it's too invested in winning the contract negotiation. Oh, we made him wait. We made him hold out. We made him come down from his number. No. Do what the team needs, not what your ego requires. Get him signed. Get him here. Build your core. Go forward. To me, that's what makes the most sense. But that requires changes in the way they do things. And they're bad at that. So now I want to ask you, because I do think it is likely that maybe the 49ers want Brandon Ayuk to play this year on his fifth-year option and then have the ability to re-sign him next year. And I was DMing you about this, but just for people who don't know, because I definitely needed some clarification, because I think with the amount of different rules that people have depending on the round that they were drafted and stuff. Yeah. If 
the 49ers have Brandon BA play on his fifth year option this year. And then they extend him a contract af- offer next year. Is Brandon Ayuk a free agent? He has the right to say no to that and like be like, I want to go to a different team. Or is he still under contract? He's still he under say- contract. Okay. Yeah, he would not become an unrestricted free agent. So they could say that no, we're just going to let you play on your fifth year deal. And then we're going to give you a franchise tag contract. And you know, he still has to sign that. He could hold out and say, I don't want to sign a tag deal. Um, the franchise tag this year is 21.8. Next year, it you know, depends on how high the, the cap rises. It'll be more. But they could do that. The problem with that all is... What happens when Ayuk holds out and what happens if he then says, I'm not going to start the year with you. I'm only going to join the team so that I get enough games played to accrue the year. I mean, he can't hold out all year long because otherwise he doesn't get the contract year. But other than that. He wants to, doesn't he want to play well so that, um, so that other teams are willing to give him the contract? Like if he, I think it makes it like another contract year for him. Because he basically has to prove that he can, you know, do replicate what he did last year again this year, so that another mm-hmm. team is willing to pay for him again. He basically has to repeat that process. Yeah, he to a degree, but you know, the Niners would still hold his rights, so they could say, "We're going to put you on your fifth year deal, and then we're going to franchise tag you, and you're not a free agent, and there's nothing you can do about it." He's stuck, and okay. that's part of the problem. Is that so? I think that the problem for them. The main one is, what happens to your record next year if IU holds out? How are you going to open the year? You know, this year they opened well, and it was key to them getting the one seed. If IU holds out, what's the team's offense going to look like to start the year? They could have trouble. They could stumble out of the gate. They go 500. They're not going to get the one seed. And then I what are their chances question. at the Super Bowl? You know, that, they guess... have to weigh all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't think that they'd be worried about him – Holding out. Like, I think that that's my question is I don't think he would. I don't think I it's think actually would. realistic anymore. Really? You do? No, I think he would hold out you know, because he could. You know, he doesn't have to hold out for the entire year, but he can hold yeah. out for a while. He can hold out in camp. He can hold out to miss games. He won't be happy if he says, OK, you know, the Niners aren't even willing to extend me. And now I have to play on my fifth year option deal. You know, it's a lot less money. You know, it's 14 yeah. million dollars to play in the fifth year. And his, he wants an extension at 27.5. I mean, he's going to be angry. And so he's going to hold out. And I think that he would hold out for the opening games and the Niners would lose those games. And now all of a sudden you're hoping to get to the Super Bowl and you haven't started well. That's a problem. Very true. That's <laughs> they, they definitely need to avoid that. Uh, uh, yeah. No cost do they want a malcontent in the locker room. Um, I think half of the things, aside from his play, that we were talking about with B.A. is just his uh, energy in the locker room, his connection with the players and with Purdy. All that goes off the window if he starts getting mad at the organization and uh, expressing that. You lose his goodwill. Yeah. yeah. Now, something you talked about is a way that they could um, look to extend him, some money that they can allocate that maybe they thought was going to be tied up in a different player, is with Brock Wright, who the 49ers today, like I said, a lot of random breaking news came out. Um, The Lions ended up matching the 49ers deal that they worked out with Brock Wright and keeping him. He was on like a – it's the same thing that Jennings is on, right, where – uh, it, it's close. It's a restricted free agent tender, but yeah. Jennings has a second rounder attached to it, and Wright doesn't. There's no draft compensation. So my immediate takeaway was less. It was less whether or not you know about the okay. Now the 49ers are probably going to get a tight end in the draft. Kind of already thought maybe they would do that. I'm less worried about the player, and I'm more worried about. What does this say about the organization? This is now the second guy that they've kind of missed, you know, swung, thought that they had missed out on. This is their first year without Adam Peters. Um, I don't know. It just, it looks messy. It's a bad look. Yeah, it's sloppy. It It, it does. It it looks unprofessional. It looks, yeah. They put their time and resources into coming up with a contract with this guy and they weren't able to make it happen. To me, that says something about your organization. Either you didn't know how much to offer him to make sure Detroit wouldn't be able to counter, or you should have known 
what you were willing to give that Detroit was probably willing to, you know, counter and to not waste your time and make that offer. Like just feels like there was some mess in the, in the office that there was some, there yeah, it, it felt like there was a disconnect in terms yeah. of what you offered him had to be something Detroit wasn't willing to match. There needed to be mm-hmm. a poison pill in the contract in terms of guaranteed money up front or something like that. They thought the 6 million guaranteed would be enough for Detroit to not match. But Detroit has the Niners circled and saying that this is the team we got to beat for the NFC Championship. Yeah, this is who yeah. we need to beat to get to the Super Bowl. Why would we do the Niners a solid by not matching the contract to this tight end, so that they can avoid having to pick a tight end in the draft? I mean, it's Detroit matches and they make the Niners worse because now the Niners have to use a pick on a tight end. And part of the reason I think they signed Brock Wright to the offer sheet was they aren't sold on the tight ends in this draft. They don't want a tight end in this draft. But now they have to, unless they sign somebody in free agency. And so you look at it and say, okay. And man, whoever that's who going to be is a guy the that they ends? like less than Rock Wright, which is kind of what how yeah. we felt about the uh, guy from the Chargers that ended up going to the Cowboys. Eric, right. right? Hendricks. Yeah. And, and so it's just with Wright, it's – Great blocker, a good receiver, not a great one, but an untapped resource. You know, he had 14 targets, 13 catches. So when they threw to him, he was reliable. You know, it was only for like seven yards a pop. It wasn't much. But he was enough of a factor as a receiver that he could be effective as a second tight end. And now the Niners have to draft that. And this draft has receivers or blockers. It doesn't have both in one player. Which is That's not what they the like. problem. That's why they – put the offer sheet out there to write. But they didn't offer him enough for Detroit to say, no, that's too rich for us. We'll let him go. Does so they didn't do their feel... research on the yeah. Lions as far as what's it going to take for Detroit to say, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. Exactly. And like I said, that's more my takeaway. It's just it makes me feel less confident in the front office that yeah. stuff that they, it seemed like they had understood and – and um had had a good head on their shoulders when it came to how to retain players, how to intensifies in intensifies. I don't know if that's the right word. Players to come want to come to the 49ers, contracts that they wanted to offer him, offer them. Just they've made a lot of I, I think having that previous mistake in free agency to start off because that was early on in free agency that that happened and then followed by this, it just makes me feel not great about the front office and the way that things are being run right now. I'm like, why do you guys keep making these little, like I I assume people look at these things and it's like, Oh, it's not a big, big deal. It's just the second tight end, but it's like, it's more, what does this say about the organization that they didn't do their research to know what to offer? And like you said, what to offer in order to keep Detroit away or, Hey, we're not willing to offer whatever that would take. So we're not going to waste our precious time we're gonna right. go look at more guys we're gonna go look in the draft instead they just like spent a lot of time and energy and then had the rug kind of pulled out from, no. from under them yeah well one of the the deficiencies of this front office is they tend to wish things into being and so they're kind of hopeful they just said well we can offer him this and detroit might not match because they like james mitchell the time like they drafted a couple years ago you know it's just you're hoping too much as opposed yeah. to you're structuring the offer in a way that they don't match it. And it's you're not trying to win. You're trying to hope and get away with something, and you didn't. You, know, you brought in Justin Blackman, the safety from Indy. They just signed him to a one-year deal. You bring in this guy to an offer sheet in Detroit, and they match it. And it's just, do you want these people? Do you want these people on your yeah, contract like I- terms? And when you want them on your deal, you're hoping and wishing, and they go for more money elsewhere, or they're kept by their current team. You don't is, get them. You have to get them. They didn't. I don't know. Are, are you based in the Bay Area? I'm in Seattle. I, I grew up in the Bay Area. It's kind of like a, a reoccurring joke the last five to eight years, maybe, with the Giants. Every offseason for, for baseball, it's like, they're in talks. They're in talks with this guy. You know, like they're, <laughs> they almost had him. They, yeah, they were yeah. right there. They were right there. And it's like. I don't know if those reports are supposed to like make fans be like, oh, they're they're trying to make a big move. They're they're trying to get into it, and then they like literally never do it. And you're like, okay, right. stop telling me 
Let me know when you have something actually figured out because you just look incompetent right now. Yeah, and well, it I looks like they're crying things. wolf or they're showing that, gee, we almost got this guy. We're really trying. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like trying now, makes a difference. Now, one guy that they did get, and once again, a lot of these like moves, they're, they're you know, one-year deals for guys who are going to be backups. So a lot of my commentary on this is actually like, what does this say about something else? So... The 49ers signed former Packers running back Patrick Taylor to a one-year deal. And I think I saw on, you know, on Twitter, on the timeline, kind of a lot of, hey, Elijah Mitchell, always struggling with injury, getting, you know, a little bit older, definitely not reliable. This is going to be a, a the Patrick Taylor, the guy that they just signed, is going to be a camp body, maybe keep competing with Elijah Mitchell, you know, depending on if he stays healthy or not. Going to be a backup, obviously. You know, they have Christian McCaffrey, whatever. Um, this is more of an Elijah Mitchell replacement. I heard a lot of that talk on the timeline. Yeah, my I immediate, I My immediate thought was just Jordan Mason, man. You're never going to see the field. Kyle Shanahan has his little crush on Elijah Mitchell. Obviously, Christian McCaffrey is going to be Christian McCaffrey. This team likes to, you know, honestly just give Christian McCaffrey 100% of the targets anyways. Yeah. So, to me, when I saw this move, I did not see a goodbye Elijah Mitchell. I saw, a, oh, shit, Jordan Mason, I hope you figured out that pass protection stuff that they said you were struggling with because this yeah. is the guy they're bringing in for you, which breaks Maybe. my heart because yeah, I want them I to buy that. utilize him. Yeah, but Jordan. Yeah. You know, Jordan Mason is a great back, and if you I give him the so. ball, look what he can do. Six point four yards a carry. Come on! But because he fumbled in he's a like preseason our little game, gem. Like, yeah. like all the fans are like, we know that he can do it. We whoever know gets, <laughs> yeah, whoever gets Jordan Mason next is going to be a really happy team, and Kyle's going to look like a fool because Jordan Mason fumbled in a preseason game. And he didn't pick up a pass like, pro. Two years ago, Brock Purdy threw the ball to the other team on his, on his first start, and now they're going right. to pay him like right. it, It's just yeah, you know, it, it it's just one of the things that, with Kyle is that if you do something he doesn't like at all, he can doghouse you, and as you did with IU, <laughs> and then look what happened well, with IU. So if you can give Jordan Mason those kind of opportunities, look what he could do. So. In, in terms of this guy, Patrick Taylor, he's, he's he's a camp I I subscribe to. He's a camp body. He's a special teams guy, and so it's okay. that's what it's mainly about. Is that can he make the special teams rotation? If so, he's got a chance to make the roster, but I don't think he will. I think that he's a camp body and he's part of the ninety man team, but he's okay. not going to be part of the fifty three. And that's just like they have to bring in guys just to fill up the the yeah. spots and and have the. Yeah lower rankings compete with each other type of thing. Right. Okay. Yeah. So I wouldn't read too much into it, but Kyle is still going to ignore Jordan Mason and we're going to be both be upset by it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just, I, I thought that that commentate commentary was kind of funny. Just people being like, Oh, this makes sense for Mitchell. And I was like, you guys don't think how Kyle thinks <laughs> that is not what Kyle's thinking, but Kyle you're loves probably Mitchell. more realistic that it Mitchell, is a um... Kyle loves Mitchell. Why? He never fumbles. Kyle hates Jordan Mason. Jordan, Why? I mean, he Jordan fumbled. Mason Christian McCaffrey fumbled in the Super Bowl. Yeah, but it's Christian he's... McCaffrey. I know, but I'm just saying, like, <laughs> maybe we should give – maybe if 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 we base everything off of fumbles, then Christian McCaffrey wouldn't have the ball. So maybe we should look at Jordan Mason. Also, has well, Jordan Mason fumbled? No. In a right? preseason game. I know. I know. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> what has he done in the actual games besides get like in between five and seven yards per carry every time, even right. though the right. only thing they're doing when he's in the game is running the ball out. Like the entire defense knows all we have to do is stop this guy. And he's still average. And they still can't. That many yards. Yeah. 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 So so, oh well. But yeah, with Patrick uh, Taylor, I wouldn't read much into it. Can't bother. Okay. Um, and then I wanted to kind of transition. I, always talk about on here. I love your, your articles that you do for oh, SI.com. Um, I was reading one yesterday morning is when mm -hmm. you put it out. Right. And then yeah, I was reading questions. it again. Yeah. Yes. And um, I 
stole some ideas out of there that I thought were interesting and maybe some can be applicable to some of the stuff that we have going on. For example, the draft. Now, obviously, last week when we talked, I think literally the day that we talked, because we talked on a Tuesday, I think it was Eddie or not. Not Eddie. Uh, yeah. Jed York had just talked. And um, one of the questions that he was asked was kind of about the difference between his standards in the past and his standards now and Eddie DeBarlow's ability to bring all these Super Bowls to the 49ers and bring the Super the 49ers, you know, to be this legacy organization, which ironically has been then called the lemonade stand by this current front office. Um, and Jed York had a pretty defensive answer, kind of immediately pushing it off and saying, well, there wasn't a salary cap, even though there was a salary there cap was. in 1994. Yeah. Um, but you could tell it's it's definitely a soft spot for Eddie, De- or for, got to stop doing that, for <laughs> Jed York. God, he would hate, uh, Jed York would hate me. For yeah, he that. would not. Um, but one of the questions that, that you talked about made me want to ask what is an what was an underrated key to the success under eddie DeBarlo, and maybe can the 49ers learn from that and i think that most of the time when people think of you know the eddie DeBarlo time they think of joe montana steve young and the quarterback and that's very true but something that you pointed out is actually their incredible ability to draft, to draft right. well, and obviously their coaching. And I think that those are yeah. two things that Jed York didn't talk about when he was asked about the comparison. You know, he just talked about, oh, the ability to have players, the ability to have players, and, you know, have the best quarterbacks and all this. And it's like, okay, well, are you are you saying that everything else, if you had unlimited limited salary cap, everything else is up to par? Because I would beg to differ, and I think you made a good case that it's not. And the two places that those that really might stand out is Bill Bill Walsh and Kyle Shanahan, and then John McVay versus John Lynch, and all the incredible drafts that happened under Eddie and John, and then the you know frankly frankly really poor drafting that's been going on recently under you know yeah yeah, under this era so i'd love to kind of ask you to elaborate a little more on that because i found that perspective so eye-opening because i think it is so um maybe like surface level like it's the the first thing that people do think about it makes sense the quarterback is the thing that people think about you you gravitate to the players and, and you look at the spending and say well yeah 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 he could afford to have joe montana with steve young as backup and now you could never do that in this year. And that's true. But Bill Walsh versus Kyle Shanahan as a coach, not close. Nope. Bill Walsh's staff versus Kyle Shanahan's staff, not close. But the biggest gap is between Walsh and John McVay in running the front office and running their drafts. You look at what they did, and it's things that I don't think that Shanahan and Lynch would ever consider. So, for example, 1980, the Niners – had a draft where they said that you know, we got destroyed in our secondary. And so the 1980 draft, they picked Ronnie Lott, Hall of Famer in the first round, Eric Wright, pro bowler, defensive back, shutdown corner in the second, Carlton Williamson, pro bowl safety in the fourth. So they devoted the top half of their entire draft to a single position group. Yep, and Man- the Niners did that in this draft at offensive line. It would blow us all away. We would never expect it to happen, even though it's exactly what they need. The and 49ers that one way absolutely how, yeah. need to devote their first their first couple picks to that offensive line. And you're right. I think if you pulled 49ers fans and you said, you know, would this front front office be willing to devote that many picks to to that offensive line? Because they could ostensibly they could turn around their entire offensive line this one draft, right? If, if yeah, they and this is the like... draft to do it because it's so deep yep. and it's so good at the top. And now, so you part of what some... they could do is like trading up for Mims is that if you've got a player that's that good and you can trade up and get him, then you've got your future left tackle. And that's the most important move for this roster over the next couple of years is you have to find someone that can replace Trent. Yeah, 
And so yeah. whether they can That's or not, you know, we'll see. And, and here's That's the draft where you could do that. And if this was a front office run by Walsh and McVay, they would do that. And that's the and point. And that, that goes back to we're talking about, aside from building a team to win this 2024, it's like, okay, if Brock Purdy is your guy, you want to invest in protection for him. You want him to be around for a right. long time. You're thinking about highly paying him. Don't you want to protect your assets, your resource? You're thinking about extending Ayuk and bringing a new core in. This draft where there's all these guys that are have way more likely of, of making it for this offensive line and really contributing long term. Why would you not want to put your resources into that right, right. now when you can right. build it, the it, foundation, if, right? And offensive exactly, line is the, the future core. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If it build your future core, if you want to say we want to move toward Purdy being the focal point of the offense, we want to move toward Ayuk is the top option. And we want to make sure that we replace Trent. The best way you can do all of that is by trading up from area spins. And that's a move that Walsh and McVeigh would certainly consider. Because you look at it and say, okay, well, but gee, the Niners were just in the Super Bowl. Coming off of their Super Bowl win in 84, what did Walsh and McVeigh do? They traded up to 16 and they took Jerry Rice. I mean, think about what these guys did. They identified who, and then they went up and they got it done. And that's part of the separation Conviction, between right. Doesn't John Lynch always say, regimes. say like he he always uses that word wrong? But you need to have yeah. you need yeah. to have um and and I feel convicted like convicted is just the term that Lynch always yes uses. yes. And I think fans would be surprised, but feel hopeful and optimistic if the 49ers really did kind of like narrow in on some players and be like, we're going to get our guys and it's important to us rather than kind of seeing who falls to you and just getting, obviously right. getting best player available in that situation is best instead of like reaching for a guy. But there is something to kind of feeling like when we're talking about how this front office has looked incompetent, feeling like, Maybe they do, they have put in the effort, they do know what they're doing, and they feel that much uh, confidence about a player to really go up and, and want to make them a part of their team moving forward. They could. But, you know, they did trade up for Jair Brown, and that turned into a smart move. Yeah, they did. But they also drafted a kicker in the third round. They also drafted Cam Latu in the third round. So that's uh, a problem. And that, that's the other thing with Walsh and McVay is they didn't just trade up for who they wanted. They traded down for who they wanted. In the 86 yeah. draft, they traded down again and again and again. ESPN was making jokes on, on the air of saying that you know, the Niners are going to end up with every pick in the sixth round. And they kept <laughs> trading down, trading down, trading down. And they ended up with eight guys who were starters or major contributors and a Hall of Famer in the fourth round in Charles Haley. You know, could the Niners mm -hmm. ever do that? Can you imagine the Niners having a trade? or a draft where they trade down, they get eight starters and a hall of famer. Yeah. It just doesn't seem like it's possible. It doesn't seem them. like something that would happen nowadays at all. No. Now, if they, so you're hoping that they trade up, right? For, yeah. for Mims. Yeah. Trade and up how for would, Mims how would you do A couple of ways. They could either trade, you know, uh, are you can 31 to Pittsburgh for 20 and 51 or trade your first and your third round pick I like that. to Pittsburgh at 20 and take Mims there, either one. And then in the second round, you know, can take I a ask look you at, really quick? Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Can I ask you? So with Mims, I I've seen I so when I talk to you, I feel like very like, yes, I want to go get him. <laughs> but then I forget who I was talking with. It might have been Steph and she on Monday and she was pointing out that Mims has had very little playing time and suffered for Eight some starts. injuries and stuff. Is there any part of you that that would be scared to give up such a high draft pick on a guy like no, that? No, I think Mims is all pro level ceiling, you know, and possibly Hall of Fame. You know, I'm totally sold on this guy. In the eight games that he has played, he's dominated. You know, part of it, yeah, there's there's injuries. You know, he had tightrope surgery this year, so he had to come off of that. But when he did, he played well. And then he got hurt against Alabama and he decided that since yeah. I'm in the draft, I'm gonna pull out. But he could have played if he had chosen to do so, I believe, but he didn't. And it's wise because, you know, you're, you're getting drafted. So that's part of it. But it's just – I look at Mims in terms of his skill set and just say that this kid is that rare. That you've got a guy that's 
68340 that ran a 50740 and looked really fluid doing it, who yeah. can play at a very low leverage. He bends his ankles, he bends his knees, he bends his back so that he has low leverage and he dominates people and he sends them flying. You look at what Georgia did when he did play and he was great. You look at the 2022 against Ohio State and he shut them down. So no, I just look at Mims and I say that if, That's and yeah, it's an if, too, but like if he can stay healthy, I think that he'll end up being the best tackle in this draft. And that what you said there with him uh, shutting down, I think Ohio State is what you just said, right? Yeah, is, 22. It's not like his very few starts were on, you know, some random football team. Yeah, They Georgia. were for an incredible football team that had tons of players that could have, you know, on other teams stepped up and taken over his position, but he was playing well enough on that team to keep that, you know, starting role in the games that right. he did start in. And we've see, seen him face competition that will be, you know, NFL material, which yeah, is important. Yeah, especially with Ohio State, which always produces good edges and a good defensive line. You know, they're always going to challenge you. So you're facing pro-level talent right away. Yes. Now, what I wanted to ask you, because you did lay it out, is if you feel like the 49ers don't take your advice and don't go all in on the offensive line and trade up for a guy like Mims, one, you think it's pretty much impossible that Mims falls to 31, right? Yeah, that isn't going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That'd be um, nice, but no. You know, Baltimore, I think even was, if like, he fell to 30, on. Baltimore is so smart an organization. Eric DaCosta is one of the best they GMs would, in the league. They'd be like, we're not they giving you to the 49ers. Mims. There's no way. He would not make it to 31. Not a chance. Mm -hmm. I you think want I Mims, you have to trade up for him. I think, uh, do you know Rohan? He writes for 49ers website. Yeah. Or actually, he might write for Niners Station now, I think. Uh, but he put out like a mock draft that had Mims at... 31 and literally just because i do this show with you i'm like always looking at me uh, whenever i see mims i'm like okay where is he going he's like, <laughs> he's like in my head it's like tom's guy yeah. and he had him there which is a lot lower higher in the draft lower higher words you know what i mean yeah but there, there's some people um, there's several people that have had mims dropping to 30 mel kuyper had mims dropping to 30 uh, there's other people who have had him go to 30 but again, and Baltimore's not 31. too smart. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. no way. Not a chance. Um, so if they don't go get Mims there with their first round pick, um, you laid out some players that you thought potentially might be there. Also, I was talking with Eric Crocker, and he had Darius Robinson as a guy that he thought the 49ers could look at. One, because I guess he's a good run run stopper, D-line. 49ers love to draft D-line. Yeah, yeah. He's, um, what he's do you looked think at – He's looked at as an Eric Armstead replacement in that he's a hybrid guy that can play outside, inside. And he, okay. he does well against the run. The problem is that he's slow. He, he doesn't have the burst off the line that Chris Kacarek likes. Yeah, and, like that second, the ability to have that second step, right? Right. That They want to have somebody that penetrates quickly into the, into the offensive line. But beyond that, I think that Robinson is overrated. He was... He got a lot of wow treatment from his practices at Mobile, but in those practices, he used a lot of the field, and it wasn't duplicating a game situation. You know, he was beating his man by taking him wide and then beating him, and that's not something that he would be able to do in the NFL. Okay. So I think that people were overreacting to what Robinson did by not applying the NFL game context that to his sense. practices. I'm not a Darius Robinson fan. I don't want him. But there's a lot of no. people that do. And I think that part of it is that these national folks that are doing these mocks, they're looking Don't at it and saying the Niners need to replace Armstead, therefore Darius Robinson. The Niners need a no, tackle, no, therefore no, Tyler Guyton or Jordan Morgan. They're not thinking as the Niners would in terms of you've got this position, now what? You know, I think the Niners are looking at it more in terms of who drops that we would value, who's the best available at 31. And I think that in that case, it's Jerjon Newton, the defensive tackle from Illinois, Kool-Aid McKinstry, the DB from Alabama. And I've heard Cooper, about him before. And Cooper DeGene. He always sticks the, out to uh, me because of his name. Yeah. Oh, great name. I mean, how can you beat a guy named Kool-Aid? <laughs> and, and then Cooper DeGene from Iowa. Though I'm fearful now that DeGene will get picked. Um, he moved his pro workout day from the 15th to the 8th. 
and that shows a lot of confidence in what he can do. So he must, you know, he's coming off of a leg injury. So he must be very confident that he can now produce the 40 times and do the drills that the NFL is going to want to see from him. And that's what's been holding him back. That's why in the mocks, he falls to the Niners at 31. I don't think he will now. I think he'll have a good workout in the eighth, and that's going to reestablish the gene, and he's going to get picked in the early 20s, and he'll be gone. So for the Niners, I think that Newton and McKinstry are the guys that they're hoping will fall. And it's just a question of if they do. Can you tell me a little bit? Do. Can you start starting with, with Newton? Could you tell me a little bit about him? He's a three-tech, so he's just you know what you would expect from Armstead inside. He's quick. He's good against the run. He's fast. He's a little bit undersized in that he's only like 6'1", 6'2", but he has great legs. He needs to work on his lower body anchor. He needs to work on his moves a little bit. But in terms of just the general athleticism that he works with and his work ethic, that his motor is always running hot, that he's always disruptive, he's always making plays, that he's a guy that they would value. And then the concern is just, will he last to 31? In the current mocks, he goes usually in the low 30s and in the top 50 rankings of big boards of various evaluators. Daniel Jeremiah from NFL.com, he had Newton at 32 on his latest big board from yesterday. So it's right on the cusp is that Newton might be there. And if he is, I think the Niners would look at him. McKinstry, it's, he's a great cover corner, and I think that he's kind of underrated in that aspect because he doesn't have the – the blazing 40 time, but he's the kind of corner that the Niners are going to need going forward is somebody that can cover and also defend against the run. You know, Ennis Rekestra from Missouri is the best run defender. Now, the gene is number two. So there's a couple of guys. Do you say that? Cause you think the 49ers will eventually move off of Traverius Ward? Cause you said, no, kind of no, well, I They've got a lot of people that are free agents, but yeah. they need a third defensive back and what they specifically need is somebody that can play outside, stop the run, and blitz. And there's a couple of guys in the late first who could do that. You know, DeGene would be the best at that. Rick and then Estra, you have them on a rookie deal, which is incredible. That too. For a long time. Yeah, and Rick Estra from Missouri is probably the best run defender, and he attacks the run. He's another guy that they could look at. The one that I hope doesn't fall to the Niners but might is Nate Wiggins from Clemson, who ran a 42840s really fast. And he now can cover. You, you hope he but doesn't? he only weighs 173, 176. He doesn't invest in stopping the run. He can't blitz. And so that's not the kind of yeah, DB the Niners good. need. But a lot of mocks will have Wiggins as like a top 22, top 25 guy. So and he'll end up falling to the Niners 31 because he's so light. You know, the, the league is moving to simulated pressure and blitzing from your secondary. Wiggins doesn't fit that. And so he might very well end up dropping to the Niners at 31. And I think they'd end up passing on him because he's not the kind of DB they need. So I'm looking at this and saying that Jerjon Newton, Kuwait McKinstry, those are the guys that the Niners are hoping will fall to them at 31. If they don't, they might end up moving out. And there's a lot of teams that will want to move into the first if they're looking at a quarterback and they want the quarterback to be drafted in the first round because you have an extra contract year if you're taken in the first. So Michael Penix, Bo Nix as the, the fifth and sixth quarterbacks, there's a lot of teams that might want to move into late first to get those guys. I don't want them to trade back, though. I don't like the idea of that. It depends on who they have is on their board and who they value. You know, if you're at 31 and Newton is gone and McKinstry is gone and you're not completely sold on Rekestra and you don't really like Jordan Morgan, then what? And so it might be that they want to move back to get extra picks later on. Because a lot of the draft, the, the value of the draft, there's a couple of sweet spots. Um, the top 50, between like 40 and 50, you get great value, good players. And we'll see uh, what they do. But there's also another one that's another sweet spot in the third. So there's there's players that they could value where they want to get two players instead of one. And they could do that by trading back. Okay. Okay. Now, can you tell me a little bit about Kool-Aid McKendry? Kool-Aid <laughs> is um, 
I don't know exactly how he got his nickname. I don't know, but it's, it's from, <laughs> from childhood. I like that that's the most important thing about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Um, he plays for Alabama, and, and they have the best pair of defensive backs in the country with Terry and Arnold and McKinstry. I think that McKinstry is probably the second best cover corner in the draft that you know, Arnold and McKinstry and Quidian Mitchell are the top three. And it's who's second, who's third, you don't know. So McKinstry is great in in terms of covering his man. He does that exceptionally well. In the run D, he's not as big as you would want, but he still commits to it. He still will make the effort to make the plays, make the tackles. And he's technically sound as a guy that played at Alabama where he knows how to tackle and he can get that done. So McKinstry would give you – an outside cover corner that's truly elite, a guy that can be a lockdown number one cover corner. That's what he would provide. And you you talked about Eric Crocker. You, you talked to Eric about these things. Who's his top cover corner in the draft? Cooley McKinstry. So that tells you a lot that when Crocker is saying that I love this guy as a cover corner, yeah, that's that's coming from someone who that's knows. That's a good uh reign of a reign of endorsement. Now, right, really quick, right. Mr. Corey. Um said 49ers need to draft an offensive tackle in the first round only one taken in the first 20 years since we talked a little we were just talking about cornerbacks and we talked a little bit about defensive linemen uh i do i saw Corey also join just a little bit ago so we did talk about how both tom and i agree we would love for their first uh one to three picks depending on if they can consolidate two of them in order to move up in the draft to be on the offensive line. We would be team that we think that the old organization with Eddie DeBarlo and Bill Walsh and John McVay would be open to doing that. But we are just um, t- talking about these options because we're not sure that the 49ers would be actually willing to do something like that. Um, okay. And then Chris A. says McKinstry was given the nickname Kool-Aid by his grandma when he was born. That's awesome. Oh, cool. Okay. I love that. My grandma, I wonder if it's just like a grandma thing. I used to drink Kool-Aid at my grandma's. Oh, nice. She used okay. to have all it's the small, little like. The Kool-Aid man. That's cool. Thanks, all Chris. The powdered, all the powdered drinks. I wonder if powdered drinks are like a, a grandma thing. My grandma had Kool-Aid, yeah, which she mixed yeah. with water. And then she also had tea. Like it was like powdered tea and she had this little cupboard where she had the Kool-Aid container. She had the tea container and she had magic shell. Do you know what that is? Like the hard chocolate. It's like this hard chocolate. You can make, I make it nowadays just with like cocoa powder and like a little bit of coconut oil. And then if you put it on ice cream, it like hard, it solidifies. And that's like a healthy way to do it. But they definitely sell it at like Walmart. It's called magic shell and it's like sugar and, process oils and terrible more sugar you. yeah yeah and <laughs> yeah. more sugar and it was just in this cupboard and i remember my grandma used to go take her bath before bed and i would sneak into the kitchen i would take spoons of this tea right you put one tea in like a giant tea container for like the whole family and you start in water i would just shovel it in my mouth i'd take the tea like <laughs> shovel it in my mouth and then i would squeeze the magic shell in my mouth and then grandma would be like time for bed when she got out of the bath and i'd be like <laughs> okay. yeah yeah <laughs> like i'm gonna but you're all bath. wired on sugar you're not going to bed anytime soon <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah yeah my grandma was the same way we, we had kool-aid and she would have the best cookies she would just always have these great bakery cookies that were so good Love, them. love. Um, love that. Mr. Corey, if you don't or can't trade up for Mims, then Kingsley, no. Um, Suamata Ia is let's put it this way he was a five star recruit who went to Oregon, he couldn't make the field, he transferred to BYU because he couldn't break through. So that's one I'm like off of B- BYU players, although I do know Fred Warner, BYU player, yeah, yeah, but, Fred was good, yeah, but yeah, but it, then also just, Zach Wilson. Yeah, so, yeah. Gotta be careful. You gotta be uh, careful with these BYU players. Yeah, to get an apples to apples, the, there was a lot of people this time last year who were talking up Blake Freeland, who was another BYU tackle, highly athletic, but he bent at the waist, and the Niners said, nope. And uh-uh. he went on to play in his rookie year and play poorly. And so how is BYU viewed in the NFL in terms of coaching up tackles? That's not good. that great. 
Um, but for Suamadi, so he goes as a five star to Oregon, can't make the field. He transfers to BYU. Now he's a five star playing in the Mountain West, and he doesn't dominate. And so again, it's a question of can he put it together? And the the issues with with him with Kingsley is just. He still needs to get his technique down, and his technique just isn't there. And he's had four years. He's had you know, he has the five star pedigree. He has all the talent you would want and need, and he hasn't put it together. When is he like going to do that? Will now, he do yeah. that in the NFL? Maybe. Not um, again. You know, he, he's now. got great. He's got some great tools. You now he was very good in the bench reps. He had thirty one bench reps in Indy. Uh, he's got good speed. He's you know over twenty two well, in the GPS. But was it you that was telling me though? You don't want to fall in love with the the combine stuff. You want to see what they were doing on the field. Yeah, you need yeah. to. F- yeah, that's me. Because um, the problem is the combine can hide things that you only see in practices or games. Where it's you get the one on one, then you see what they don't do well. And so for for Kingsley, it's he can do the combine stuff well. But in his practices at Mobile, there's a lot of people that said he was beat by bull rushers. He was beat by lateral speed. So if he plays a guy that's faster or stronger, he loses. And in the NFL, that's most of the guys he'll face. Now, it could be that Kingsley can develop into a great tackle eventually. But he's had four years. He started at Oregon, and he failed. And then he went to BYU, and he failed. Now he's going to go to the NFL, and he's going to succeed? It's a risk. I wouldn't bet on it. Um, yeah. Okay. And then the last topic that I wanted to touch on with you uh, today is I wrote, um, are the 49ers stuck in a mistake loop? What does that mean? And how would they get out of it? And once again, taking from your article from everyone who's watching, please make sure to go read Tom's article. He put it out yesterday on SI.com. It was four questions for the 49ers. He's always putting out great articles to read all of them. But a lot of what we've touched on today, aside from the breaking news that happened today that we weren't expecting, um, has been from this. And so within this conversation, I wanted to kind of talk about the Rams and Baltimore, we were just talking about them being smart in the draft, just a smart organization overall. Um, but John Hardball and then Sean McVay both hired assistant game managers to help with decision makings for their offensive coach, you know, offensive side of the ball during the game. Critical, you know, if they think it's a catch on the field and someone's running down and maybe the coach didn't see and he's trying to come up with the next play call, there's a guy who's on the field, same thing. Uh, the Lions had something similar happen where they, you know, go for it on fourth down or don't go for it, stuff like that. Yeah. They had those two teams hired a guy specifically. His job is to help with those sorts of decision makings. We think of Kyle Shanahan and his oopsie at not knowing the overtime rules in the Super Bowl, which is just one of the most horrible things. That, yeah, it's yeah, crazy that that's like just. That happened, and now we're moving on um, from it. So I kind of wanted to ask you maybe what you meant within this paragraph that you – or a couple paragraphs that you talked in your article mm-hmm. about. Um, and then also, yeah, yeah, I, gu- I guess I'll just ask you that question with that pretense of talking about the assistant head coach and, like right. I said, the two, coach- the two teams that I mentioned doing that, both have won Super Bowls. 49ers were not mentioned in that. 49ers have made it to the Super Bowl, but unfortunately not been able to make it over that hump. Is that correlated to you? I would say yes. Yes. Um, Part of the concern with the Niners is that the only person that can tell Kyle Shanahan no in this organization is Jed York. John Lynch is the GM in name, but he reports to Kyle. Uh Kyle has final personnel control. He's the true GM of the team. And that played out in the trade his for dad, Lance. Like his his dad got fired. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying Kyle's going to get fired, but his dad, like, I just feel like you never want to have too much power. Like these coaches that we're talking about who hired assistant coaches are smart guys and they are aware enough to go, hey, like actually what's best for me is to not have all the power, you know? Yeah. I, or I at that- least to have a sounding board of somebody to say, what about this? What about that? somebody that Kyle can run ideas off of and bounce those off of him and someone that could be great at situational coaching. 
So you would have someone that would tell Kyle, throw the challenge flag in the NFC Championship against Philly. You know, Devontae Adams trapped that ball. They're rushing up to hike it. Of course he trapped it. They know they're getting away with it. That's why they rushed up to the line. What happened? Kyle froze. He did nothing. If you had an assistant game manager, he would know. He would say, throw the challenge flag. And there's a lot of examples of that for Kyle. It's the Rams NFC Championship game in 21. Debo didn't touch the ball for the final 10 minutes in Debo's all-world year. It's, where is somebody telling Kyle, Debo isn't in your game plan here. What's going on? Um, the Super Bowl against Kansas City, somebody to tell Kyle, our defense is getting gassed. We have to run the ball now. It may not be the ideal optimal play call right now, but our defense needs it. You have to manage the game itself. And that's where you need a game manager. And Sean McVay and John Harbaugh had the humility Kyle, to say, we need to do that. And Kyle says, no. Yeah. And with Kyle, who's not only the head coach so overseeing the whole team, but he's also the offensive coordinator. Uh, I don't even think there's any shame in being like, hey, I'm focused on what's the next play call. What? How did they just respond? He's looking at their defense, seeing how they're responding to what he just called and how that influences what he's going to call next. I don't think there's any shame in in saying, you know, Not at all. It, hey, it like makes... I need someone to oversee these, you know. What, and, and I think what you said, that's probably even better than how I put it because I kind of was like, oh, a guy to make these decisions for you. And you kind of were like, no, just a guy that you even check in on, which – you know, I mean, I, I've been kind of angry, like, at, in, in previous, you know, in this last season and even the season before that. How is there not someone on the team that's like, hey, Kyle, no, right here, we need to be doing this. Or no, we need to be doing this. So, like, I think with with the lapses they ma- they've made, it is shocking to me that they haven't, like, put one person, like, your job is to make sure to kind of oversee things so when I'm – on the intercom, you know, yelling with this coach and doing this, being like, there's one guy who's like, this is what I've been focusing on. This is what you should do here. Yeah. Someone that's a stopgap or at least someone that can say in this situation, we must do this. Yeah. And Kyle is so focused on looking at his call sheet and saying, what's the next play? You need somebody with you know eyes and a mind to apply to the game situation and say, throw the challenge flag, get Debo involved call running plays to help your defense rest things that Kyle misses because he's so focused on the next play. Um, yeah. Or someone that can tell Kyle, you, know, you can do more than just hand the ball to CMC. Absolutely. <laughs> there true. Are other so there, there's a lot of stuff um, that's like I that. Ask you, and do you think, do you think, cause, cause we just mentioned, I will say, I think when we're, like I said, going back to the two guys that you mentioned in the article, John Harbaugh and, Sean McVay, I think something that those two coaches have in common, aside from the Super Bowl, no offense, Kyle Shanahan, is humility. I think both of them have been able to stand in the media, take blame, not take, you know, push it off to their quarterback. They've had big wins and big losses, both of them, and they've made corrections after their big losses and really um, had teams that, that where they empowered the players and their assistant coaches and general managers. And although they've, they run the team, they've been the head of the team. They don't feel, it doesn't feel like dictatorships when I think of those coaches. And I really, like I said, it take, takes me back to humility. Do you think yeah. that uh, Jesus maybe has a point here? When oh he says yeah. Kyle's there, too there's arrogant no question. Today. Yeah. Is Kyle too arrogant? Yes. Um, and, but part of this is that he's got control because Jed has given it to him. And the other point that I made in the article is that I think that the real key here, the root of every Niner trouble spot, every Niner problem, why they don't win rings, goes back to Jed won't touch the football side because Kyle is the franchise cash cow. And Jed values the money first. Money over football is everything. Jed York would rather have a profitable franchise than – one that is women winning Super Bowls. That's why right. he considers he what they've want, done, you know, yeah. all, so superior to the lemonade stand that is actually the reason the 49ers have the legacy that they do and the fan base that they do. Right. Yeah. The it's lemonade crazy. stand won five rings and made it possible for your marketing machine to get the money it now makes. 
none of that happens without the lemonade stand. So that's Kevin, part of it was a really good show. Just rewind like the little thing at the at the bottom and make sure to watch it all because we went over, we had a ton of breaking news. And then my favorite part has been going through these questions with Tom from his article. You can also just go read his article, but right yeah. now is our time. I think uh, Rob Stratz Guerrero always says that. Like if he like is promoting something, he'll be like, not now. Now is our time. So I'm stealing from Rob and saying, don't go do that okay. now. Rewatch our show, but then go read Tom's article and put them both together. So, yeah. But thank you so much for joining us, Tom. Sorry. Sorry about that. I think that was actually my bad because I had the time. Oh, no worries at all. Um, Great time. And then, always, always. And then Mr. Corey, just going back really quick because I just saw Tom uh, Kevin's comment. So I skipped, skipped her. Corey's but Corey said people thought uh Anthony Lynn was going to be that guy and I wanted to agree with with Tori I with Corey I also did assume that when, when he was first brought in he was kind of sold as if he was going to be that or actually he was right. first brought in as the running back guy and right. then that didn't work out they brought back Bobby Turner from like surgery they were like we don't care if you're here like you need to come and then it seemed yeah. like People were like, well, what's Anthony Lynn doing? And they kind of so what's that. Anthony Lynn? It didn't right. seem to be that at all. No. I don't well, I think they need to have somebody in that specific role. And that person has to be answerable to Jed so that Kyle doesn't just ignore the guy and say that you know, I'm not going to give you the time of day. You, know, yeah. you need to have someone that's an assistant game manager that will tell Kyle, look, dude, no. And somebody has to tell him no. Somebody has to course correct for him and get him back on the rails when – He's too focused on the next play. Yeah. I mean, so whether or not Anthony Lynn was supposed to be that, he definitely wasn't. He wasn't. Yeah. That's yeah. the bottom line on it, unfortunately. And and I think when we go back to Jesus, you know, saying um, Kyle has his nose up in the air, is he too arrogant? Those questions, whoever this guy is, has to be a guy that Kyle Shanahan respects because – Maybe you can give that guy, a t you know, if Anthony was that Anthony Lynn that in title, he surely wasn't that in practice. So it's kind yeah. of this catch 22, which I like that you're bringing it back to, hey, let's not only uh, judge Kyle Shanahan for this, but let's ju judge Jed York because he's someone who can actually be saying, hey, Kyle, these are these are things that we want you to implement. You know, this yeah. isn't something and I don't want you to give a guy a title. I want you to. I want there to be a guy on the team and I want you to take him seriously. And, you know, as the overseer of this organization, that is a position that I am hiring that I'm going to be paying. And I want him to be a part of this team. But Jed York does not have the, for lack of a better word, like cojones to say that to Kyle Shanahan. Right. Because he's so focused on what Kyle can do for the team financially. But Kyle optimizes the Niners financially. He fills the stadium and he gives them, one or two home playoff games a year, which are pure profit. So when the team is an annual contender, fills out the stadium and has home playoff games, he's the golden goose. And, and Jed decides that I'm not going to touch the golden goose. I want him to keep laying these home playoff game eggs. I want him to continue to deliver the money. And so nothing ever changes. He doesn't touch Kyle. And as a result, Kyle can only change if he decides that's necessary. And Kyle's arrogance and narcissism are such that he won't do that on the areas where he does need to change on his philosophy on the offensive line, on using the offensive line as a salary cap saving center, as you know, which is crazy. A number of, you know, just why, yeah. why, yeah, in, in this era of the NFL, why are you not investing in your offensive line? It doesn't make sense. So, especially you know, with Jed York couple, coming out and being like, I can't wait to pay Brock. It's like, hey, don't you want to protect that? Because we've seen what, it, as 49er fans, we've seen you make a guy, a quarterback, the highest played player, and then him get injured immediately. So maybe you could not do that again. Yeah, um, yeah, take, it just, take this opportunity right. to change. But, but it, you're right. It, right now, they're having success with it. The 49ers are making money. And yeah. so, yeah. yeah uh, as he Jesus says, says the, the Lions drafted their OL. Yeah, well, Brad Holmes, one of the best GMs in the league, great drafter, knows what he's doing. You know, took a risk yeah, on today's Sewell, and it really paid off for them. So it, it, it comes down yeah, again to – That was like a contentious uh, thing too, right? Cause didn't, didn't yeah, because they had the choice stuff? of Jamar Chase or Panay Sewell, and they chose to take Sewell, and it worked out for him. And that's yeah. a GM that 
knows who he's targeting and why. He has philosophy. He knows what he wants for his team, and he got it done. And now and, here I mean, they look are. Look at what they've done with the Lions. Yeah, they've like, turned that yeah. organization around. Right. And Holmes is For, probably the almost most lost important him. reason why. Yeah. Lost and, and so yeah, imagine if the Niners had had Holmes and Detroit had Shanahan, where would the Niners be? Where would where would Detroit be? Yeah, that's scary. But, oh, well. But, but the larger point is that Jed won't touch Kyle because of the financial success, and therefore Kyle won't change the areas that have to be changed for the team to win a ring. So they're stuck in a loop. I definitely hope that um, the 49ers go O-line on this defense. Haizu says O-line is key against defenses, uh, against rugged defenses. I agree. And with the 49ers and the goals that they have, it's important that they start investing in that offensive line. Um, Tom, I had such a great stream with you today. I don't want to say his name because it feels funny to say but uh, we got a lot of people in the in the uh chat saying good show i i enjoyed everyone kind of commenting on like i said a lot of this came from tom's article so please make sure to go follow him i gotta hide this for his name to come up but tom jensen or 49ers cast on uh twitter make sure to follow him si.com is where his articles are posted and make sure to like and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Um, I think I'm going to be doing a call-in show tomorrow, and then I am streaming with Marco on Friday. And apparently Marco predicted the Stefan Diggs trade. Talked yeah. about it a couple yeah. days ago. Marco so has sources. He's real. He's plugged in. That's crazy. I'm excited to ask him about that. Um, Mr. Corey says Jake Brin Dundell's car salary basically became guaranteed. What is what is did something it, happen, it's the or? start of the new league year, and so it, as the the calendar year turns over, Brendel's deal becomes guaranteed. It, it's not like they were going to do anything at center anyway. Unless, what what about Graham? Uh, he's Graham a, Barton uh, is, is now looked at as the top center. He's taken over from Going Jackson early. Powers Johnson, Too and early. yeah, Barton had a pro day where he did really well, ran under five in the forty, and did all the drills well. So Barton is now projected to go to Miami at 21 or 22. I forget what they pick. Um, so if that's the case, then Barton's out. Uh, there's a lot of talk that Jackson Powers Johnson won't get taken in the first. So you know, there won't be a center that the Niners take at 31 unless they trade down. Okay. Okay. Well, interesting. Um, I'm still hoping, crossing my fingers for – Avarius Mims, is that how I say his first name? I always, yeah. I literally don't even try to say his first name. Whenever I can't pronounce something, I just pretend that it it, it isn't there. Sometimes there's like commentators that I'm like, this guy, because <laughs> I feel bad. <laughs> I'm like, well, I don't want to like butcher it. I've never been someone um, who cares about like pronunciation of my, my last name, maybe just because I don't have that difficult of a last name. I get people that spell it wrong a lot, and I've never cared, but I know some people do. Like I had a coworker who was like really frustrated when people would say his name wrong. So I'm like, I would rather just try to not, unless obviously I'm close with you, then I'm going to like ask you and make sure, sure that I get it right. Sure. Um, Mr. Corey said, hoping that, that we moved on from Brendel with an angry face. And uh, I think they really like Nick Zakel. It'll be interesting to see what they do. Um, like Tom, Tom laid out a really great argument for them to, go complete O-line with their first uh, one, first, second, and third pick. I thought it was a great strategy. We talked about it earlier on in the show. Yeah. Um, I would be in full support of the 49ers doing that. I know maybe a little bit boring, but I think if you can just use one draft to solidify a part of your team that's going to be with you long-term, I think it's worth it. Uh, we Absolutely. laid out that we think previous organization or parts of this organization that – in my opinion, are more successful, even if maybe their nose are, you know, turned up on compared to some. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, please trade up for Mims. Corey is is on it with you. This is how Tom has that level of excitement inside him. Don't worry. Um, but, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> thank you guys so much for joining us today. I had a really good stream. I was surprised that we had so much um, breaking news to talk about and then really, really enjoyed going over that article with you today, Tom. Thank you yeah, so much. Just- or... Thank you, Ashley. This is a great time. You know, always yeah, enjoy yeah. being with you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. And everyone have a great week, weekend coming up. Be safe. Make sure to drink water. Enjoy the sunshine.